Okay, let's let's start then. Hi everyone. My name is Nick Nesbitt from Princeton University, and I want to welcome you all to this uh, discussion and uh, celebration of this new book uh, that uh, uh, we've come out with called Revolutions for the Future, May 68 and the Prague Spring. And on behalf of my co-editors, Jana Njai Berankova and Mikhail Hauser and myself, uh, we'd like to welcome our speakers who uh, have also published chapters in the volume, contributed chapters in the volume, and uh, everyone who's, who's uh, joining us today for the discussion. And uh, we will, uh, uh, after a brief introduction, then we'll, uh, a number of us will, will present on aspects of the book and sections and themes of the book, and we'll have uh, time for discussion and questions uh, along the way. Uh, and so first of all, I want to thank uh, very much uh, Charles Leonardi and Kelly Eggers at uh, Princeton in the Department of French and Italian, who have helped us at the, at the last minute uh, valiantly make this shift in deference to the strike at, uh, at Columbia and made it possible for us to hold the event nonetheless uh, today. And uh, so they've, they've really gone beyond the call of duty and thanks to them. Also, thanks, yeah, thanks very much, Charles and Kelly, and, and also to Yana, who, who uh, uh, I would say has, has really uh, uh, driven uh, this project in many ways uh, uh, and, and, and made sure that it's, it's carried forward into this wonderful book that we have now. And it's really uh, a, a magnificent accomplishment. She's gonna talk a bit in, in a few minutes about the publishing house that uh, she's begun, Edition Suture. And it's our, it's I think the third volume. There's also this volume that we put out uh, a collection of some talks by Alain Badiou, which is also incredibly aesthetically accomplished and, and, and a beautiful volume. Uh, and, and this as well, it's really something to behold. And uh, uh, we'll be talking about the, the contents, but the, the edition itself is wonderful. And uh, so hats off to you, Jana. Thank you for that. Uh, so this project began back in 2017. We had a conference on this theme of the articulation of May 68 uh, and the Prague Spring in 1989 at the French Institute here in Prague. And uh, then, uh, since then, we've brought together uh, some of the original contributions that have been expanded and developed and as well as others uh, that weren't originally in the, in the conference. And the book itself is divided principally into let's say three sections after a, a preface. There's a first section on May 68 and the logic of the event. And then a second on Prague Spring and suppressed inventions. And then there's a final postscript that Joe Feinberg uh, penned uh, on 1989 as the end of a sequence. And let me let me just uh, read, if you will, uh, two or three paragraphs with by which I, I I began my presentation of the contents of the of the book itself. 1968 is the proper name of a global event that continues to resonate over a half century later into the present conjuncture in which a shaken neoliberal consensus confronts anew the specter of revolutionary transformation. 1968 names an event that resounded across continents, a series of interventions taking varied forms from Beijing to Berkeley, Rome, Berlin, Sao Paulo, and Mexico City. It's the contention then of this book that the Paris-Prague doublet names in turn a particularly potent reflected site of articulation in this global sequence, one that deserves particular interrogation in the rich complexity of its voicings. So to speak of Prague, uh, 1968 in Prague and Paris as a single event is to assert that in each of these sites, 
there occurred a restructuration of the norms of social being. To name 1968 an event in Paris and Prague is to confirm that in each of these sites, there occurred a revolution in both structure and experience in which, as Jacques Rancière affirms in his contribution to the volume, quote, an event therefore is not only the unforeseen that happens, but that which calls into question the way in which things happen, the way in which they happen on a particular stage, for example, on the political stage, the way in which they happen in general and in which thinking in general relates to them. At the same time, the relation of these two eventual sites, Paris and Prague, is not one of mere identity, but rather the staging of a chiasmatic contrast. In May 68, not only in Paris, but all across France, there occurred a political upheaval that witnessed the single greatest general strike in French history, a monumental coalition and intervention of the intellectual student and industrial working classes that brought the routine functioning of this leading Western country to a standstill for an entire month. And in the gap that opened when business as usual ceased its routine functioning, a shocked conservative consensus could only perceive formless chaos, la chien lit, literally bed shitting in the words of de Gaulle's famous rebuke. For those on the street, however, an explosion of creative energy occurred, which was unparalleled in post-war experience, a deployment sustained of sustained anarchic freedom that marked a generation. In Prague, in contrast, the arrival of Warsaw Pact troops in August 1968 marked the brutal termination of the sustained political aesthetic and existential experimentation of the Prague Spring and its drive for the autonomous transformation and reform of Stalinist political and social structures. When Soviet tanks compelled Dubček's compliance with the dictates of Moscow, Czechoslovak society suffered a restructuration of its norms of counting not as the freedom of Badiou's red years of political experimentation, but in the form of the grim and violently enforced consensus, the proper name of which is the baleful euphemism, normalizatze, normalization, a social detente that would last until 1989 and the effects of which resonate into the present. So, uh, This then is uh, the, the book that we've presenting, that we're presenting here to you today. And uh, let me just conclude uh, uh, by, by uh, mentioning my own contribution to the volume in this first uh, uh, section on 68, uh, where I, I called it the concept of the commodity. And there I looked to, to Badiou's text from 1968, the concept of model where he gave two speeches in 1968. The first one was uh, uh, actually presented and the second one was never given because of the events of, of May. And then it was only republished uh, much later uh, uh, after 2000. And so uh, uh, there I'm, I'm looking at the level of formal uh, 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 theory and, and looking at the relation between 68 and 89 as, as a break, the way that Badiou understands that movement in his own thought from something like an ultra formalist materialism in the concept of model, a materialism of the concept to something that we could maybe call an axiomatic materialist logic of the necessary forms of appearance of things in any given world. And then in my contribution, I, I appended this uh, 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 disjunction between theoretical disjunction between 1968 and 89 with Marx, capital in particular, as a sort of palimpsest and beginning to look at the way uh, in which we can, it, it, it would be possible to pursue the original project, the Althusserian project of reading capital and of Cahiers pour l'analyse in, in this period leading up to 68. Uh, in something like a, a positive logic of capital. And uh, uh, in, its, in the erasure, the paradoxical erasure of capital from the subsequent, many of the subsequent developments of these thinkers, and Althusser, Machere, and Badiou 
in particular are, are of interest to me. And uh, so in, in, in my chapter then, I was uh, uh, interested in this uh, uh, disjunction between 68 and 89 at the theoretical level and pointing forward to the ways in which uh, uh, the promise of that original period uh, of 60, 65 to 67, the group Spinoza also, uh, can still, still remains to be carried forward in the development of something that we could call a, after, after Machere's critique of Hegel in Hegel or Spinoza, 1979, something we could call a positive dialectic, identifying it not just in Spinoza for Machere, uh, or in a, in a sort of abstract logics of worlds for Badiou, but in the text of capital itself, breaking away from its, the negative dialectic, that Hegelian reading that's still predominant today in many, uh, many readings of, of capital. So that's, that's uh, something that I was interested uh, in, in looking at in, in my own contribution. And let me, let me just leave it at that for now and, and pass, pass the word over to Jana. Thank you so much, Nick. And again, thank you, Kelly and Charles for hosting us. I think why one person we need to acknowledge also is Sarah Monks from the ICLS at Columbia, who made all the possible for this event uh, to happen. And then unfortunately we needed to shifted to Princeton at the last minute uh, because of the strike. And it's somehow interesting to what extent actually the current context, let's say social political relates also to some of the things which we try to explore in our book. So I would uh, briefly present uh, our publishing project overall. And then I will talk briefly about the contributions in our book, uh, which uh, relate to the, let's say the context of French philosophy. So let me just uh, show you a few images here. Um, uh, as you see my amazing PowerPoint. <laughs> Unfortunately, I would, I would prefer for this event to happen in person, but as we can't happen in person, I at least uh, try to show you a few images of what we do, because I think the the material context uh, of knowledge, I mean, the books themselves are pretty important. In our publishing house, which we call Edition Suture or Suture Press, and which is a, a very small nonprofit organization run by me, my husband, Cher, and two other people. Uh, you know, we see books as something, I would say, kind of a mne mnemotechnic tools, uh, because I think there's something, uh, especially about philosophy books, uh, we need to think of the book not only as the medium, but also as the place, as a sort of architecture of knowledge. And so our idea was very much to, to mobilize, uh, you know, the sort of knowledge of uh, book design and book production that, uh, uh, that has a quite a long tradition in the Czech Republic or former Czechoslovakia. Uh, since there were many figures like, uh, you know, Karel Taige, Ladislav Sutnar, and so on, people who in the interwar period were very much working also on the typography and graphic design, and to try to connect it somehow with the philosophical work that we do. Uh, so, you know, we produce books uh, actually very slowly. For now, it's like maybe one book per year, but let's hope that it will grow. Um, and so for now we have published uh, three titles and hope to publish uh, another uh, book, another art monograph this year. And then we're working on a project of a uh, book on African socialism. And there are other book projects which are in negotiation, uh, especially Reza's book and, and uh, you know, which at the moment when the manuscript will be major, uh, we hope to publish too. And, so we run a small uh, e-shop, uh, which I'm giving you the links here. So you can also see all the recordings uh, from the conferences, which we organized in Prague uh, with this little informal group that you see here on the screen, uh, which we somehow call a very informally Prague axiomatic circle. Uh, 
um, somehow rethinking the original Prague linguistic circle, but playing with the words a little bit uh, in the present. And one aspect uh, that's really important to me, and that's a little bit the title also of the publishing house, uh, Edition Suture or Suture Press. Obviously, it, uh, to those of you who are familiar with Lacan or Badiou, you might see the famous notion of the suture. But for us, the play with the words was also to point to the fact that the books that we produce have, have a clear uh, material presence and they are actually stitched. Uh, so it's a really sort of, a, you know, cloth binding and, uh, you know, and uh, traditional stitching. So there's a, this whole procedure of the stitching of knowledge uh, and stitching of philosophy, we somehow played, uh, you know, with this idea. And so this is the book which we're actually presenting today, um, which, as Nick said, originated in this conference in uh, 2017, but then actually I would say the content moved pretty far from the original conference. It turned into something much more developed. And it was a conference which we organized uh, in the French Institute and also in the National Gallery uh, in Prague. Uh, and that was an occasion to actually invite Jacques Rancière in Prague and to sort of connect our work on, let's say, continental philosophy or French tradition with also the work of the group uh, that uh, Ivan will present here, and that means people who work on the heritage of, uh, you know, Czechoslovak Marxism of the 1960s. Um, and the book has illustrations, so we really, you know, besides the cloth binding, we actually try to really pay attention to, uh, you know, the visual aspects of that, uh, of that volume. And here you can see just a brief, sort of presentation of just to have an idea of not only the content of the book, but the actual form, uh, you know, that uh, in which this knowledge is located. Uh, and so regarding the title of the book that we're presenting today, um, some people asked me actually why, you know, why did we call it uh, revolutions for the future? Because somehow it doesn't make sense to uh, to talk about the Prague Spring and about May 68 as something for the future when we present two past events as being for the future. And I think by this, uh, me and other contributors of the book, I don't want to talk for everyone, but at least for the editing team of uh, Nick and Michal, we wanted to point to the fact that uh, history somehow often unfolds in breaks, leaps, and ruptures. And we were very much interested in the way how, um, you know, in history, you often have things like the resurrection of names. For instance, in the, in, in the book, uh, Sometimes We Are Eternal, uh, of um, Alain Badiou, and Nick uh, points to the fact that somehow, sometimes you have these names in history like for instance, the word Spartacus, that sort of travel uh, you know, from one uh, century to another. So on, uh, you can have the Sparta, uh, Spartacus revolt in the Roman Republic, but then you also uh, this, uh, see um, Toussaint Louverture as so-called black, black Spartacus. And there was also the Spartacist League in Germany at the beginning of the 20th century. So uh, by saying that these events are somehow for the future, I think we wanted to point to the fact that, you know, sometimes to answer our present problems, actually, uh, the answers to our present problems can be actually located in the past, or let's say in the forgotten possibilities of the past, like the specters of Marx, you know, these events to some extent uh, haunt us. And so we brought together Prague Spring and May 68, and we called it a chiasmus to sort of point to the heterogeneity and similarity and heterogeneity of these two events, to point to the fact that somehow these two events uh, seem to mobilize, present a different role between the, let's say the social movement and the state. Um, for instance, uh, you know, comparing the fact that uh, in France, uh, the, the role of the state and the students movement is quite different from the Prague Spring where the movement was actually somehow 
you know, launched by the state, but then also exceeded the, the expectations of the reformist wing of the Communist Party. Uh, so it turned actually to something uh, quite different. And I think by bringing these two events together, we also try to, to combat something that I would call our present amnesia. And we wanted to point to obliterated memories because somehow these two events, uh, for instance, in, pra in France, uh, May 68 is often portrayed uh, through dominant narratives, you know, that describe it as something that's related to, let's say, a hedonism, sexual liberation, the advent of neoliberal consumer culture and so on. And in, Czech Re in what today is called Czech Republic, uh, you know, the Czechoslovak Prague Spring, is often reduced to the August invasion of the troops of the Warsaw Pact. And so the, the let's say the creative aspects of this event, like workers' council or you know, all these discussions about workers' autonomy and so on are often ignored. Um, an example to give you would be the philosopher Karel Kosik, which maybe Ivan will be talking about, a prominent figure of the Prague Spring who you know, after 68 could not teach at the Charles University uh, during the so-called normalization, peri uh, normalization period. Then he returned to, then he returned to university, uh, you know, after the Velvet Revolution, and he was quickly fired again uh, because in the 1990s, the period which was marked by a wild shock therapy privatization of state enterprises and let's say a kind of mafioso uh, you know, um, transformation of Czech Republic, um, what that I would name as a sort of for, sort of organized de-development of this country, it was almost impossible to talk about Marx. So someone like Kosik was somehow an uncomfortable figure in both of these regimes. And so our questions in this, that we're trying to ask in this book are, how do these two events compare? And what recipes for the future, or what in French we call l'avenir, you know, actually can these two events propose us, you know, by what can what recipes can we find by studying the past somehow? And how does philosophy in this case, because some of the contributions of the book are relatively theoretical, so how does philosophy relate to these historical events? And so the book uh, opens by uh, an article by Jacques Rancière, in which uh, Jacques Rancière uh, asks, uh, you know, in what condition uh, can one consider the, um, the certain set of facts as an event? And he points to the, to the fact that in many ways, uh, May 68 is often portrayed as an imaginary event. And we have this, uh, you know, ambiguous role of the French Communist Party as a sort of ambiguous uh, intermediary body which is uh, not always, let's say, in line with the real workers and students and, and other uh, struggles, and, and tries to somehow protect the working class from the contagion of the revolt and to collaborate with the government in order to, to, de to defend the normal game of social relationships or what Rancière in his vocabulary would call the police logic. You know. And so Rancia talks about this kind of predominant uh, sociological vision of May 68 and, uh, you know, this kind of notion of the police logic. And, and uh, he tries to show that actually maybe May, May 68 was something quite different. And, you know, that he sees May 68 as marked by what he describes as non-sociological politics. And again, you know, uh, I think it's pretty funny that we're here at this moment, you know, when we talk about histories from the uh, May 68 and during the Columbia strike where also, you know, we have this, uh, our actually students union, you know, and, um, you know, the so-called United Auto Workers working as a rather controversial intermediary body, maybe comparable in some extent to what happened with the CGT and so on. Um, then uh, Rancière's uh, paper is followed by a contribution by Vincent Jacques, which is also here, so you can answer to any of your questions, in which uh, Vincent uh, talks about the article published by Gilles Deleuze and Felix Gattari in 1984, uh, entitled May 68 did not take place. 
And Vincent shows us that uh, according to Deleuze and Guattari, May 68 actually did not take place because in a, uh, and I would quote, it somehow belongs to the order of a pure event. So to take place for Gattari and Deleuze would be to belong to a certain historical causality. And Vincent uh, shows in a very like um, subtle manner how actually, you know, Deleuze uses the theory of the Stoics and how it, this article actually relates to Deleuze's theory of the event and how in what extent can 1968 be seen as a sort of new configuration of the possibles. Uh, which is related also to new forms of subjectivity and that in a way for Deleuze and Gattari, the French society may not have been up to the level of the event. So in a way it was in, incapable to assimilate the May 68. Then we have a very nice contribution by Etienne Balibar, which I'm not going to talk about in much detail because Etienne will be talking himself after me about Lacan and the four discourses, uh, um, so-called uh, discourse of the master, discourse of the university, discourse of the historic, and the discourse of the analyst. So I somehow skip uh, and pass my word to Etienne afterwards. Um, then myself, what I tried to do in my article uh, myself was to actually sort of playing with the name of our publishing house also was to read the concept of the suture in the work of Jacques Alain Miller and Alain Badiou, sort of comparing the notion of the suture in uh, Miller's 1965 lecture, uh, suture elements of the logic of the signifier, uh, which was then published in 66 in the first issue of the Cahier pour l'analyse uh, with um, with uh, Badiou's response to it in Mark and like on zero, uh, they think from 69. And so I was trying to show that in a certain way, uh, you know, uh, Miller's approach is marked by, let's say an attempt to delineate something like a logic of all logics, uh, something that we might call an archeologics. And, um, you know, by studying Frege's concept of zero and that in a way, uh, Comparing Miller and Badiou, we can see two different approaches to the structure. On the side of Miller, it might be the, the idea that we have an excess in the structure and that the structure is somehow complete but inconsistent. Whereas on the Badiou, the approach would be more to see the structure as, as incomplete but consistent. And so I try to uh, point to these two differences between what I might characterize as a disseminative and subtractive approach on the side of Miller and Badiou. And finally, uh, to give you an idea of what Reza, whom you have here, so we can also ask questions here, uh, Reza Naderi uh, worked on. So Reza wrote a paper on uh, Badiou 69 concept of the model in relation to Sylvain Lazarus' uh, anthropology of name and his notion of the politics. And so uh, La Reza points to the fact that uh, Lazarus presents politics as an engagement without an object. It is purely subjective and purely taught. And that uh, for Lazarus, May, May 68 was an important eventuality that closed one era and opened another one. And so Reza, what he tries to do is to think Lazarus and uh, think back you through three categories, which he himself calls interior, interiority, subjectivity, and intellectuality. And, um, and he brings forward the categories in relation to Badiou of interiority, novelty, and beginning. And I think he can explain to you if you ask questions also what he actually means by those categories. And then obviously Nick's uh, paper, which he himself presented. So I'm not going to go into much detail about that. And, um, you know, I will pass a word to Etienne and also um, encourage all of you, if you're interested in our work to sort of support our little project and go visit our website and our improvised e-shop and I know, uh, get actually, get, get this monster. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank, thank you, Jana. I'll just uh, uh, introduce ATN. Uh, I'm sure uh, everyone watching is familiar with our guest speaker, Etienne Balibar, who is a philosopher and uh, a former student of, of Althusser. He's a professor emeritus 
at the University of Paris 10 Nanterre, the University of California Irvine, and among his many publications with which we are, have, uh, are, are familiar, there's uh, Lire la Capitale, there's the philosophy of Marx from 1995, Spinoza and politics from 98, politics and the other scene, equal liberty, 2014, violence and civility, 2015, citizen subject, 2017, and secularism and cosmopolitanism, which was published, uh, I, I think, in translation in 2018. So it's our great pleasure to welcome you here. Etienne, uh, uh, merci. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Can you hear me all? Yes? Does it work? Good. Thank you. Yana, how much time you give me? 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Can't hear you. Your mic is muted. You are muted. Excuse me, 20 minutes is fine. 20 minutes, okay. So I, I beg you, I ask you uh, at sharp, 20 minutes sharp, you cut me wherever I have <laughs> arrived. Huh? Do that, please. Otherwise you, you don't get any poma. Okay, um, let me say how pleased, how delighted I am to be with you tonight. With you all from these different places, old friends and new friends and auditors. Um, I'm extremely proud to be in that book as a, a participant, as a uh, author of one chapter, but I'm not going to speak about my contribution. <laughs> Um, first of all, I take a few minutes, if you allow me, to repeat something, but repeat on, from my point of view, something that has been said and shown, that is how beautiful this book is. I mean, how extraordinary it, uh, it is. And um, I, uh, it's, a, it's a work of art. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, combining many uh, disciplines or borrowing from them, architecture, uh, uh, design, of course, uh, typography, which is not, and uh, photography. I'm extremely uh, uh, moved and impressed by the uh, um, pictures that you have uh, gathered. I mean, they have an intrinsic relationship, of course, to the uh, event of uh, 68. Uh, my feeling was that you wanted to uh, avoid not only the well-known, but also the spectacular, uh, in a sense, or the pathetic. Uh, but still, of course, the tragedy is uh, there. And also, of course, the uh, hopes and the momentous uh, uh, aspect of this uh, event. I believe that to publish books as works of art is an act of resistance and hope against the current in this uh, uh, moment, uh, in these dark times for culture, for communications in the strong sense. And therefore I value this enormously. And I'm sure others, readers and uh, users will uh, value it. Um, now, about the content of the book, which is, of course, the main subject of our uh, uh, discussion today, uh, let me begin with something that uh, uh, can seem uh, a little formal. Uh, um, it has been said, I agree with that, of course, that the uh, distinctive character of this book is a combination, is, has to do with the combination of uh, theory in its uh, most uh, um, radical or uh, um, demanding uh, abstract, in a sense, uh, uh, sense, theory of philosophy on one side and politics on the, on the, on the other one. Uh, so they are uh, uh, put together, brought together in a kind of, uh, disjunctive synthesis, uh, to borrow the famous Deleuzian uh, uh, category. And uh, as a consequence, of course, they uh, produce, uh, uh, their combination produces uh, 
remarkable uh, effects of uh, intellectual stimulation. But uh, in fact, the book is not organized around a single uh, um, dichotomy or a, a duality. It is organized around a double duality because uh, 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 crossing or uh, um, perpendicular, if you like, to that uh, distinction and articulation of philosophy and politics. You also have, of course, the Paris versus uh, uh, Prague uh, uh, dichotomy and uh, uh, the echoes and uh, uh, differences and uh, resonances from one place to uh, another. So uh, the effect, of course, is a structure. It's, a, it's an extraordinary uh, structure. Uh, you could say that uh, this illustrates, as Yana has just proposed, the idea of suture or uh, stitching, but, uh, and I agree with that, of course, but the suture is a binary category. It has two edges, uh, and this one has more than two. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a more complex structure for which I uh, would very much like to borrow the German, the fundamental German philosophical category of Zusammenhang. Now, uh, the result, I believe, is something unprecedented. Um, and this uh, uh, could come only for uh, a group from, excuse me, not for, from, from a, a group or a, a community, I would say, of uh, crazy people, crazy uh, uh, others. Uh, I'm not, of course, counting myself uh, <laughs> in that I'm much too uh, reasonable. Uh, uh, academic and these crazy people who thought imagined the uh, the book and realized uh, uh, it of course resurrected the typical and typically uh, philosophical combination of the uh, unsight gemesis the uh, uh, untimely and therefore as a consequence the extremely timely uh, uh, um, uh, combination of uh, ideas and and words now, uh, um, let me uh, say, uh, I'm still in the preliminaries in a sense, and I know that uh, Yana will cut me very shortly now, but uh, 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 let me also say something which I hope is not uh, uh, narcissistic, is, is a little more personal uh, about the uh, meaning of that uh, uh, encounter, I would say that uh, uh, recollection of memories from Paris and Prague in uh, uh, 1968. Uh, uh, um, this is of especially uh, strong uh, resonance and, and meaning for somebody who, like uh, me, was a young communist uh, in uh, those uh, years, and more generally for a whole generation of uh, uh, French communists. Uh, I visited Prague uh, uh, before 68, I'm not going into memories, uh, and I returned much later uh, after 68 with the uh, Jan Hus uh, uh, Association that had been uh, um, founded by Derrida and Jean-Pierre Vernon and, 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 and others. And in the meantime, of course, uh, Prague was never very far away uh, uh, from uh, our thoughts. Uh, I met uh, in particular, I remember that very dearly uh, several times with Arthur London, with whom I discussed uh, several aspects of the Czech uh, 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 situation. But more generally, as you probably know, there was a kind of uh, direct, uh, almost uh, uh, intimate uh, uh, link between the communists of the two countries. I was, of course, a dis heretic, I'd say, or a critical communist, but still a communist. Huh? The Maoists were obsessed with China, huh? uh, a mythical China, of course, a China which we now know has very little to do with uh, what was actually taking place there during the so-called Cultural Revolution. But many of us were more uh, uh, interested, uh, were interested in China, but more interested in uh, Czechoslovakia. And by the same token, I must say that for me, Prague is remains the capital of Czechoslovakia. Uh, this is something very, uh, at least historically. Uh, and uh, because this is, of course, uh, one of the places and perhaps the main place where we were uh, uh, looking for the possibility, I would not say of a reform, we're going to return to that. That's the main theme of some of the contributions, especially by Hauser, by uh, Kuzel, by Feinberg. 
which I read with in, enormous interest. But I would uh, say a re-foundation, a new foundation. Yana just used the category resurrection. That's a very uh, 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 a good term of uh, um, uh, socialism and, com and, 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 and communism, uh, which would be linked, of course, directly to a radical critique of state uh, socialism, which at the time we didn't want to call totalitarianism because it was linked to uh, with what we thought was the pure propaganda of the uh, Western uh, uh, imperialism, but uh, Stalinism, uh, 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 if you like. So a radical critique, that is not a counter-revolutionary critique, or that is not a capitalist uh, uh, reversal. And as a consequence, of course, we witnessed and, and, and looked at what was taking place uh, uh, there with a succession of uh, hopes, great hopes, expect great expectations, the famous title uh, uh, says, uh, enormous uh, uh, admiration, and then, of course, sorrow, and even finally a despair. And we're still with that question, is there a legacy of all that? And this is what the book is addressing. Now, uh, in 1989, almost everybody would have said no. There is no uh, legacy, no meaningful legacy. Uh, some time ago, perhaps around 2008, when the other hopes of uh, or other people uh, uh, from 1989 started to crumble, at least uh, <clears throat> In ideologically or intellectually, we might have uh, uh, begun to say something like perhaps. And this book says a resolute uh, yes. And this is what we, of course, want to discuss, the modality of this alternative. Yana, how much time do I still have? I leave you 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes, OK. So I have thought, uh, perhaps I don't get to the end, but I have uh, been thinking of three items uh, or three uh, successive questions under which I uh, uh, wanted to address this issue. The first has to do with the concept of the political. I should be, of course, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a seminar <laughs> very long on that, and I'll have to be uh, uh, very short. It occurred to me that the question of the concept of the political is really one of the axes and the centers of this uh, uh, book. And uh, of course, one of the uh, themes uh, which organized the uh, uh, echoes and, uh, and, uh, and, and the correspondences between the two, uh, the two sides or the two uh, parts. Now, of course, this issue is addressed, this theme is addressed through a number of important references, especially in uh, um, uh, French uh, philosophy, but also implicitly in, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, Czech uh, practice. And several names are invoked, Lazarus, uh, um, Deleuze, et cetera, et cetera. And they are all, of course, worth uh, 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 discussion. I limit myself to Jacques Rancière because Jacques Rancière clearly has a privileged position in this uh, uh, book. The book opens with his fundamental essay. And then, uh, uh, of course, it uh, returns several times uh, to uh, his uh, uh, remarkable uh, uh, idea of the opposition between the between politics and the police, uh, which also becomes sociology uh, uh, in some other uh, 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 context, which works in a sense like uh, 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 a circle. And of course, uh, the um, uh, description or interpretation of May 68 in France, but also uh, uh, other uh, uh, places, is the criterion for this, uh, the validity of this uh, 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 definition. Now, um, as we know, of course, the uh, essential question has to do with the uh, use of this very French uh, uh, word par, uh, which is extremely difficult, in fact, to translate. The uh, English uh, in Czech, I don't know, but the English translation, the part uh, of no parts is not really uh, uh, satisfactory because la part des sans parts in French uh, simultaneously uh, uh, alludes, uh, uh, of course, to the uh, uh, idea of being part of a member of a collective or a community and to being the destinatory or the uh, addressee 
of a, uh, a distribution. And as we know, of course, for Rancière, uh, the established order in whichever uh, society, capitalist or uh, really existing socialism, is characterized by a rigid and fixed uh, uh, distribution of parts or, or roles, whereas the uh, insurrection, typically May uh, 68, uh, uh, represents the, the moment in which uh, 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 an element uh, which is not counted uh, erupts into the situation and therefore disturbs this uh, 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 description. It also seems in Rancière's description that this is an event without a uh, uh, tomorrow, I mean, a, a continuation. Uh, it essentially has to uh, uh, do uh, a, a li a, an event uh, uh, limited in time, even if then it continues to resonate, etc. Therefore, uh, as uh, 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 the sexual encounter in some well-known uh, uh, libertine uh, uh, French novel of the 18th century, uh, the uh, uh, good motto would be point de lendemain, nothing after and no uh, uh, tomorrow, but an infinite possibility of uh, uh, repetition. Now, this seems to have to do, and perhaps I can let go further than that, um, with uh, another uh, fu fundamental opposition or binary, which uh, uh, returns very powerfully in uh, 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 Michael Hauser's essay, and especially in uh, uh, Joe Feinberg's uh, 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 conclusion, the dilemma of the political and the a and the apolitical. Uh, and uh, uh, in a sense, the very strange uh, uh, capacity of uh, exchange or, or exchanging position between these two uh, 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 characteristics. Now, um, this uh, leads in the second part of the book to something that I find quite remarkable, which I haven't seen anywhere, which is a kind of use of Rancière against Rancière. Uh, why that? Because Rancière uh, 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 seems to, uh, not only seems, but clearly, I mean, uh, uh, includes in the, uh, what he calls the police, uh, uh, as opposed to the uh, uh, political, everything that has to do with negotiating with or, or even struggling against the power of the state. Uh, there must be absolute heterogeneity. And this has to do with the uh, uh, idea that the insurrection is the absolute opposite of the institution. Uh, now, what our friends uh, 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 seem to uh, uh, want to establish in their uh, contributions is a more dialectical articulation of the uh, uh, political and the police. So here, of course, philology uh, uh, would call for very interesting uh, detours. I remind you, if you uh, don't uh, know it, or I, uh, that uh, la part des sans part, the part of no part in, in Rancière, has, of course, verbal affinity it is with le pouvoir des sans pouvoir, the power of the powerless, which was one of Václav Havel's uh, uh, favorite mottos. And both of them have their roots uh, uh, historically in a, a great uh, remarkable text by Maurice Merleau-Ponty about Machiavelli, where this uh, formula precisely, the pouvoir des sans pouvoir, is being uh, 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 used. Uh, now, what I personally draw as a conclusion from this is the uh, uh, idea that we need the third category. And this third category is, in fact, uh, uh, the category of, of, of the impolitical. Uh, so the German word, das Unpolitische, was invented simultaneously in the mid-19th uh, century by uh, Marx uh, uh, on one side in uh, uh, the poverty of philosophy and even the Communist Manifesto, where, strangely, the revolution represented the apolitical side, as opposed to the political state. Uh, and by Burkhardt, of course, uh, and who uh, transferred it, uh, transmitted it to, 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 to Nietzsche, where Das Unpolitische, later uh, used also by Thomas Mann, was the aesthetic or cultural element. I believe that the, unpolit the, 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 the impolitical is uh, the heterogeneous element. And I think that this book demonstrates that uh, uh, a thought of politics cannot be a thought of the purity of politics. It has to be a thought of the impurity of politics, provided this impurity, of course, is pushed or brought to the extreme. How many minutes now, uh, Yana? One, two? 
I give you five. It is it, it is finished. Yes, it's finished. So you're fine. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I stop. Uh, you I can stop. talk five more minutes if you want. Oh no 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 no. Okay. So I skip. I, let me just say one more thing. No, just uh, just let's finish, Etienne. No 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 no. no. Yeah, no, I'm, I don't want any privilege. Uh, so uh, uh, I um, I uh, I had the next point, which is about the trace of '68. Uh, and of course, this is in a sense the very uh, object of the book. And to put it very, very quickly, let me uh, uh, suggest that the key dilemma is whether the trace of 68, which relationship it has to the trace of October, uh, May versus October, 1970. Does 68 as a revolution or something that calls itself or is now called by some of us a revolution, reactivate, recover, uh, resurrect, in a sense, uh, 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 the trace uh, and the meaning of October, or does it erase the trace of October and uh, uh, cover it? Perhaps the truth lies in something that uh, Nick a moment ago called a palimpsest, or or that uh, Derridian would uh, uh, call perhaps a a, a a rewriting a rewriting of the uh, uh, first in the uh, second. Remarkably, of course, uh, 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 for. Uh, some of the participants uh, with various intermediary mediations, uh, which are of course extremely important. I uh, referred to the uh, 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 Chinese Cultural Revolution. That was the students in in, in nineteen uh, uh, in in May sixty eight in in Paris. But one always forgets the workers. <laughs> I'm sorry to remind you that there were workers. For them, the important thing was not the cultural uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution. They absolutely didn't care about it. But it it was the popular front. Uh, and that, of course, is, is, is an essential uh, mediation. And the articulation of the question of the popular front with the question of the popular democracies and therefore the Prague coup and so on is a, is a, is a, is a deep and complex question. So, so for them, uh, uh, some of when it was a, a reenactment, for others, it was, uh, uh, and, and particularly some later critics of 68, it was the uh, 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 latter. In fact, uh, um, uh, the, the question I, 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 I believe revolves around several uh, great difficulties which are mentioned in, in, in the book. The question of which events have a world meaning. Uh, and of course, clearly from this point of view, 68 has a world meaning, is a world revolution, provided we take into account all the, the various uh, 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 events taking place everywhere in the, in the world, profoundly heterogeneous. Uh, so this can be compared, of course, to 1917 with the important difference that in 17, the revolution seems to have one center. Uh, and 68, I believe, is the destruction of this representation of center. More profoundly, of course, 68 is uh, uh, a reversal, and this is very uh, profoundly explained uh, by Michael and uh, uh, in particular in uh, uh, a relationship to the question of the state. And of course, this again has to be uh, 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 set on the background of uh, what I would call in, in Schmittian uh, terms, the nomos of the earth uh, of the time. That is the fact that Paris and Prague are taking place on either sides of the great dividing line, uh, political dividing line between the East and the West at, uh, at, uh, at the time, and therefore uh, 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 take inverted uh, uh, attitudes with uh, uh, respect to the uh, question of the state. But the most remarkable in that sense uh, uh, is the fact that uh, uh, they do not take, and this is a strong point of the book, uh, uh, antithetic attitudes with respect to the question of democracy or radical uh, uh, democracy. So uh, in a sense, they both contribute to our attempt at understanding the revolutionary question today as a post-socialist uh, 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 question. The question of post-socialism is the central question for us today. In 89, it was uh, imagined that socialism belonged purely to the past. Now we understand that socialism is one of the uh, 
uh, antithetic elements in our present. Capitalism is not pure and simply triumphant. And some of us believe that socialism needs to be addressed from a communist uh, 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 point of view. But in any case, of course, it's after the uh, uh, attempt at the transition. Hence the final uh, reflections we could have on the question of uh, 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 revolution. Uh, the idea of revolution is central here, and it's also, in my view, the most problematic. Uh, is the idea of revolution an eternal idea? Uh, this is, in a sense, what Yana uh, uh, has uh, told us a moment ago, and I understand and admire, admire her point of view, quoting, in fact, uh, from uh, Badiou, uh, the, who himself quotes from Spinoza, uh, sometimes we are eternal. But you could also quote Rosa Luxemburg, who has more messianic tones. Huh? Uh, at the moment of the crashing of the Spartacus revolt, uh, revolt, ich war, ich bin, ich werde sein. I was, I am, I will be. This is the revolution speaking about uh, uh, herself. And of course, opposed to that, we have the uh, historicist representation, which is best uh, illustrated with the uses, which I do myself sometimes, of the uh, formula we owe to Reinhard Koselek, Vergangene Zukunft. This is a future that was imagined in the past, and therefore it's not a future for the future, it's a future for the past. Now, I do believe that we need a more critical and dialectical uh, uh, reflection on, on all that, which in particular bases itself on the remarkable multiplication of the meanings of uh, 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 the idea of revolution that has been produced by the uh, 20s, uh, 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 by the 20th century. So we now ask the question that we would never, uh, that nobody, no communist would have asked uh, 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 in a century uh, ago or in, in the 19th century, whether counter-revolutions are revolutions themselves. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, which counter revolutions are uh, can be considered uh, a revolution? Joe Feinberg uses the remarkable formula anti revolutionary revolution. Uh, this is part of the problem. But another part of the problem, and here I uh, was very uh, struck by the way in which you quoted from something of Habermas that I had forgotten uh, he had said, but is, which is remarkable. My admiration for Habermas is growing. <laughs> uh, namely, uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, the question whether there can be a revolution without innovation. Uh, and that resonates, of course, with the formula that Dijek and others are eager to, to quote, which comes from Robespierre. Do you want, can you imagine a revolution without a revolution? The issue from there, I argued in, uh, in several texts, is of course to retrieve the other motto from that period, révolution dans la révolution, a revolution within the revolution, or a revolution in the way of doing, in the mode of doing uh, the revolution or being revolutionary. This is what the uh, 20th century, I believe, has been looking for desperately, in a sense, through various experiences. And here, of course, I can recuperate the Chinese uh, uh, events themselves. And this is, of course, the question that we still have before our uh, eyes in the 21st century, except that, and here I owe something to Rancière that I want to uh, say again, even if his dichotomy seems to be a little uh, 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 mechanistic, namely the idea that you cannot really make a difference between a revolution within the revolution and the idea of democracy, provided democracy is conceived and practiced without limits. Uh, and here again, of course, I find it extremely interesting that the descriptions of the uh, 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 reversal or the anti-revolution of 1989 is insisting so uh, uh, strongly on the uh, uh, idea that the first move that in fact blocked the possibility of realizing the uh, 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 dreams and hopes of some of the uh, uh, socialist uh, uh, dissidents was to immediately declare that the democracy uh, can exist only within limits. 
democracy without limits. This is, I believe, the motto for one of the motos for a revolution in the revolution and in the future. Sorry for the length of all that and thank you for your generosity. Thank you so much, uh, Etienne. Um, I think what we would like to do now, uh, so we would accept uh, questions uh, from uh, both the public and uh, the, con you know, the contributors of our book. Uh, so I will just encourage you to, to react. But if I may, uh, I have a question for you, Etienne. Yes. Uh, because I found it very interesting, the extent to which you actually took our book, which in a certain way is highly political, but at the same time, not political in the dogmatic sense, as you said, because it's more the multiplicity of uh, politics in, within a certain count for one, uh, how you related it to this category of the Das and Politische. And I would be curious if you can maybe elaborate on that more. That's my first uh, question. And uh, my second question, which I guess you will find much more tricky uh, uh, and uh, much more direct, is that uh, you are here as you know the generation in a certain uh, sense that lived through the May 68 and I was surprised to what extent your talk was actually theoretical but uh, my question would be much more direct uh, that means what were you doing in 68 <laughs> <laughs> and you were pointing to the fact that you were a communist at the time and what did you think about the you know the complicated relationship between uh, the communist party and the CGT and the students which as you know uh, you know there are much talk about how you know the uh, parti communiste français in a certain way stopped the revolution, the potential revolution of the students and the workers and prevented the students and workers from uniting. So uh, I would like to, that you sort of confess here. Okay, 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 <laughs> I will do that, I will do that. Sh shall I answer immediately or, uh, or uh, taking, take other questions uh, before? What's your suggestion? I do what, what, do you think? what do you want. Just answer, no? Okay, I think you answer. can go right ahead. We're, we're no, no, waiting I, for more I questions. Answer, uh, I try and, 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 and be brief because I uh, really exaggerated. So uh, that's unpolitische. You know, this is an absolutely fascinating, uh, 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 I'd say, European philological question. Uh, uh, and again, there are problems of translation which uh, are at the same time difficult and uh, and, uh, and 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 very uh, uh, suggestive. The, the 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 category of the impolitical is used today by people like uh, Roberto Esposito, etc. And I find it, of course, interesting. But I try and have my personal uh, uh, use of it. When you want to translate that into English, you have a problem because the unpolitical is not uh, really uh, uh, common, and the apolitical is, of course, uh, leads you into the wrong direction. The, 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 the standard reference uh, uh, in our culture is the book that was published by Thomas Mann in 1919 uh, in German, Betrachtungen eines Unpolitischen, Consideration of an in unpolitical or an apolitical uh, uh, writer. Uh, and I will not uh, go to it and uh, know that uh, Thomas Mann, of course, reversed his positions uh, 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 after that. The genealogy uh, officially traces back to Burkhardt in uh, uh, essays from the 1840s. But what I find most interesting is the fact that Marx at the same time is using the same terminology. So of course, uh, 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 poverty of philosophy was written in uh, uh, French, uh, and uh, uh, otherwise Marx would write in uh, uh, German. But uh, what I find interesting, of course, is the fact that when Marx writes at that time, he puts himself not on the side of politics, because he has a narrow, if you want, definition of politics, uh, which associates it with the so-called political state. Uh, so the political is the state, and the state is the political state in the Hegelian or bourgeois uh, 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 representation. And of course, he puts himself, that is, he puts the revolution, and he puts the proletariat, and he puts the historic uh, function of the proletariat outside that 
uh, a real. Hence the necessity, impossibility, impossible to avoid, to uh, uh, call the position of the proletariat unpolitic, uh, that is against the political as officially uh, uh, defined. Now you might find, think that what somebody like Rancière does, and not only Rancière, Lazarus uh, does the same, and uh, Badiou also probably, etc., is just reversing that. That is saying the true political is not on the side of the uh, state, but it's on the side of the uh, uh, communist proletariat revolutionary uh, uh, force, uh, uh, and so on, and, 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 and so on. And this, of course, shows that there is here an intimate uh, uh, a contradiction that revolutions uh, uh, had to do with uh, throughout uh, their uh, story. So I try, yes, to uh, return to that opposition and and to su to suggest that yes, we have to choose, but what we have to choose is the primacy of one term over the other. Uh, the institution or the insurrection, if you uh, prefer. And what is genuinely political, uh, and of course the proletariat uh, in Marx's description was highly po political, uh, 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 is, uh, is not uh, um, on an uh, iso isolated uh, side, but is uh, uh, in the heterogeneity and the conflict of both. Reason why, of course, I don't take as political or sufficiently political any self, I would say, uh, uh, consideration of the uh, um, uh, uh, insurrectional movements, uh, uh, which try and live as if there is no state. Uh, the assembly, if you like, in some of its uh, 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 contemporary uh, uh, uses. For the second, I'm sorry, I'm too long. But for the second, where was I? Huh? I was in the middle. Uh, uh, reason why, uh, and therefore in a very uncomfortable uh, 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 position. Because uh, 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 essentially the Communist Party to which I uh, uh, belong had declared that the students' uh, um, uh, revolt uh, was a, a, a reactionary uh, etc., uh, a movement in the service of the, of the bourgeoisie. So I was absolutely uh, uh, opposed uh, to that. I was no longer a student myself, of course, at the time, and went to different places. My uh, uh, friend Alain Badiou once told me, you were never where the real important events take place. Uh, this was a very nasty uh, 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 formula, which uh, perhaps is, uh, is right. But if I want to uh, uh, be more precise, uh, I would say that with hindsight, uh, what seems to me important is not to confuse the question of the Communist Party and the question of the of the CGT, uh, which is what the legend, I would say, the post Maoist legend, uh, leftist legend of May '68 tends to 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 do, uh, with the consequence which which is that they uh, uh, see the working class in uh, in 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 '68 as. Uh, uh, they uh, uh, believe the, the working class to be, and not as it is in uh, practice. So the important uh, phenomenon in 68 is, uh, is not what is taking place on the side of the Communist Party alone, because the Communist Party uh, uh, doesn't believe, uh, or does try to manipulate the events to uh, become a governing uh, force, but it is what is taking place within the CGT. And within the CGT, of course, there is a very important uh, uh, conflict between uh, uh, two different uh, uh, wings, which were illustrated uh, later very clearly uh, uh, by the conflict between the uh, uh, leader of the CGT at the time of 68, uh, uh, Georges Segui, a former uh, resistance, and, the, uh, and his adversary, uh, 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 What's his first name? Henri, 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 Henri Krasuki. So, what is important is the fact that 68 launched a movement of transformation within the CGT, which eventually was defeated, of course, uh, and which is well illustrated by uh, Segui and uh, a group of people around, uh, around him. That took place in the years uh, 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 after. So, of course, they didn't believe that the situation was revolutionary. 
uh, in the sense of overcoming capitalism, and perhaps they were wrong. But certainly, they believed that the working, that the labor movement and the and the, and the working class uh, movement should become radically uh, uh, transformed. And that is, of course, uh, uh, the side with which I uh, retrospectively uh, uh, have, uh, with which I have most uh, sympathies. Okay, any other questions from the uh, contributors of the book? Uh, who can intervene directly? Perhaps we can move to, to other mm -hmm. <laughs> presentations, no? Maybe Reza, you wanted to ask something, so. Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi. So maybe there are some questions from the public. So I'll try to. There's actually quite a few of them. So uh, I need. I will try to read of them. Read them aloud. Uh, Sheena Jane has raised her hand. Okay. I see that. I think we need the questions in the Q and A feature. Uh, this one, for instance, Mr. Balibar, uh, in your article about the, from Jan Czerny, from, uh, he must be in Czech Republic, asked Mr. Balibar, in your article about the messianic moment in Marx, yes. you find certain dialectics of political and non-political at work in Marx, yes. which has a theological origin. Yes. In your political theory, you often work with the similar dialectics of political and non-political, Right. yet not founded theologically or trying to avoid any theological source of it, if I am right. Does it mean that you do not want to understand the dialectics of the political and non-political as a secularization of any theological thoughts? Ah, that's a good question and a difficult one. Uh, I guess we should uh, separate, uh, we should isolate, we should separate two uh, distinct questions. Uh, are both very important. Uh, uh, one of them is the question is, is, is the question of the importance of the religious element in politics and particularly in revolutionary politics. Uh, um, and uh, this is an extreme this is not exactly your question but I mention it because I believe it can be uh, also uh, raised and it's uh, a very important uh, uh, one. So, uh, um, uh, for a long time now, perhaps I owe that in a sense to my uh, Master Althusser, I have become convinced that uh, uh, religious uh, uh, ideas and convictions are uh, uh, extremely important elements of uh, politics, uh, be they present under their official name or under other names. Uh, and of course, communism historically is a movement which has extremely uh, strong and powerful religious uh, uh, connotations. Uh, you could also say that uh, if you look today <laughs> at uh, uh, who is speaking a revolutionary language uh, in the in the at, at the world scale, uh, you of course find different people, but Pope Francis is certainly one of them. So uh, uh, that's uh, an important element. The other aspect, which is more central in your question is the extent to which a theological political model of politics is uh, is uh, is uh, is necessary is necessary yes that's what you uh, suggest in order to analyze the dialectics of the political and the uh, 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 impolitical so i don't have much time for that. Uh, since the main reference uh, when somebody asks this question is a Schmittian one, uh, and hence perhaps your uh, allusion to the idea of secularizing a theological political uh, uh, model, I would prefer <laughs> I prefer, would prefer not to as, uh, as uh, 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 either um, uh, Bartleby or Deleuze uh, uh, would uh, say, which is a, another way of saying that we must find alter alternatives for 
uh, that. So yes to the idea that the religious element in one way or another is always crucial in politics. No to the idea that the dialectics of the political and the unpolitical is pure and simply a realization of uh, theological political uh, uh, models, which amounts in, in, in effect to not <coughs> eliminating but I'd say critically uh, uh, reversing and, and, and bracketing, yes, the messianic element, or more precisely, the eschatological element. Uh, uh, the more we live in times of catastrophes, which can be represented as end times, uh, as uh, Zizek <laughs> particularly uh, wrote, I mean, he's, of course, I admire him in one of his uh, uh, book, the more we need to uh, uh, think of the historical moment and the political uh, uh, forces in uh, uh, terms which are not, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, eschatological in that, uh, in that sense. Machiavellian and not Schmittian, if you want. Okay, may I read maybe another question? And I would uh, encourage everyone, maybe not just Etienne, but also address it uh, to more broadly to all the book contributors, if you want to just intervene uh, and respond to that. Uh, there's one question, uh, let me read it. Uh, in the book, especially Jacques Rancière was critical to the thesis that uh, 68 uh, in the West led to neoliberalism to some extent. Do you, other contributors, think that this idea is completely false or is there some truth in it? For example, that the critique of bureaucracy by 68 radicals was maybe more successful than that it should have been that 68 movements were after all more successful in the critique of the so-called old left than in the critique of capitalism. What do the rest of the contributors think about the following question? So I leave it to others. <laughs> <laughs> I've spoken too much. <laughs> Everybody seems to be frozen. <laughs> You're hiding <afraid>. in anonymity. <laughs> Did I produce that? <laughs> well, since no one's speaking, I, I guess I can, I can jump in. Um, okay, Joe, thank you. Uh, well, I mean, I think the easy and the easy answer is just to say that, of course, capitalism will react and recuperate, uh, I mean, it's capable. Of, we know how flexible it is. And so whatever happened in 68 would have been in some aspects recuperated. And But we can also see that capitalism adjusted and had to re respond in certain ways to, to what happened. Uh, and of course, the critique of the critique of what was in a weaker position would maybe be more successful than the critique of capital itself, which is, is a, continues to be in a strong position. So critique of the left maybe will always be more successful than a critique of capitalism. Doesn't mean it's less necessary um, in some sense. But, but I also think this is an interesting moment to look at the, the question of the political that uh, Etienne brought our attention to, and I think like a lot of us in the book wrote about, which is uh, that I think in retrospect, we can see that maybe this turning, there was a certain turning towards the political, even if it wasn't a political kind of political in uh, that happened gradually through various processes in and after May 68. But I, I think it's a very, it's a very complex phenomenon that we, we can't just point to all of the revolts of 68 and say they were, they were turning away from economic questions and not paying attention and only paying attention to politics. It's not as simple as that, but there was a certain shift to, uh, of taking for granted maybe more of the, the social or apolitical revolutionary aspects of what Marx was talking about in those early writings where he says the revolution is apolitical because it is social. Uh, 
there was some sense in which a lot of May 68ers took that for granted, not by speaking against it, but took it for granted and then focused on what seemed to be more immediate, which were problems of culture and politics, uh, which it, it's very understandable in that context. They were maybe more immediately, they demanded immediate reaction in some ways, but we can see certain long-term responses. Can I, I, I know that I, can, can I just add a, a quick thing to that? Or, a, or did very I- Very quick. Yes, very quick. Because we're over time. Well, much of the discussion is about, I mean, uh, first of all, I argued in the essay on May 68th that I published in Crisis and Critique that you find online in the journal, uh, the special issue of the journal that you find easily, that uh, a good, a good ev evidence of the fact that May 68th was challenging the established order and not the uh, and not uh, strengthening it is provided, of course, by the counter revolution that took the new liberal counter revolution that took place after. But of course, that that does not cancel completely the argument, the perverse argument uh, uh, following uh, uh, which May 68 itself was a kind of uh, uh, anticipation of the neoliberal. Uh, and this is uh, 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 something that uh, has to do with the question of individualism. So, may, uh, uh, the, what's in, and this is not the same individualism. I always argue that well, on that the individualism that you seem to find is uh, in, in '68 is best ex 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 expressed, of course, in the insistence, the quasi or. or pseudo Lacanian and in fact much more Deleuzean insistence on the question of desire, on the idea of changing life and not only transforming the, 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 the society. But this is not an individualism in the neoliberal or bourgeois uh, sense of the term, particularly because it is not the opposite, of course, of solidarity and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and community. It's a very odd and uh, unstable unity of opposites, but it's not the, it's not the neoliberal uh, uh, su su subjectivity. So uh, uh, this interpretation is, uh, which has been proposed by uh, all sorts of uh, commentators from Régis Debray to Boltanski, etc., is of course interesting, but and raises an important problem, but it is not acceptable in my view. I will maybe read one last question and then we pass the word to Michal and Ivan and finally Joe, uh, because we're already running over time. Uh, this one question, particularly uh, from Alex Taik Guangli. Uh, he says, thank you for a great talk. My question is about the global effect of May 68. The event was not simply the European suture, but to some point connected to the third world movement. Could you please talk about this link with uh, maybe other book contributors like to uh, answer this question? So shy, everyone. <laughs> well, then I answered it. <laughs> Um, I mean, of course, uh, you know, the Alex, that would be a topic of uh, another book, actually, maybe just so many books. Um, just, uh, I think the 68, especially in the West, is very much, you know, the sort of uh, uh, third world, you know, movement, which is related to the third world and sort of brings into question this whole notion whether what is the first, what is the third world, you know. In a socialist bloc, there's a whole ideology of, uh, you know, what they used to call a socialist, uh, you know, internationalism, which was more like sort of state organized uh, system of exchanges. It's really interesting because uh, there was a so-called university of what they called the 17th November, in which you had actually many like African students and students from the sort of global South going to study to Czechoslovakia. And, uh, you know, they get their education for free and then they were supposed to return. So this was uh, in their country to work as doctors and so on. 
So that was the, let's say, the state, uh, the state context. For instance, uh, Czechoslovakia itself, I read once, was uh, the biggest sponsor of, uh, you know, development in Africa, but not within the, let's say, the humanitarian context that we know now, but it was really sort of like white people working under, you know, African bosses. So it was uh, quite... Uh, quite special and I actually have a relatively personal history with that because uh, you know I find in the archives my grandmother uh, you know having African students learning Czech you know in Czechoslovakia in the 60s so uh, yes and also there are, sometimes you can find some really interested interesting links for instance uh, I remember having worked on some of the archives related to the 68 and in one of the leftist reviews, you had, uh, you know, especially the German, uh, for instance, the German movement with, uh, you know, Rudi Dutschke and so on. There was a, I found a photograph where German students in 68 were uh, protesting against uh, Leopold, Leopold Sedar Senghor, who, as you know, is the big figure of Senegalese uh, independence, but whom they saw as, you know, sort of corrupt capitalist and only playing within the sort of neo-colonial, uh, you know, movement in Senegal. So uh, definitely, yes. And I think that's, this is the topic of hopefully many books to come and uh, maybe we'll do it one day. But uh, for now, we just to keep it uh, somehow simple, we focused only on the, let's say the Prague and, 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 and France or the Czechoslovakia and France, but uh, you know, there will be much more work uh, to be done on the international 68 movement. And on that, I maybe pass it to Michal, if uh, asking him if he can introduce the, the papers, uh, will introduce the papers uh, relating to uh, Czechoslovakia in the book and Michal is a philosopher. Uh, he's a researcher at the Philosophical Institute of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And he's a long, you know, one of the editors of the book uh, and also founder of the association called Socialist Circle and with whom we organized many conferences. So uh, welcome Michal. Thank you, Jana and Nick for your work on this event. Uh, <clears throat> I would like uh, to introduce um, very briefly what uh, I concentrate on in the second uh, part of our group. I would uh, <clears throat> stress that uh, uh, the core or the leading idea of uh, this part uh, was uh, expressed by Etienne Bolivar very aptly. And, uh, I must um, say that uh, the uh, leading idea of uh, this uh, section of the book was uh, uh, very simple. Uh, if uh, you uh, have a look at the contemporary radical philosophy um, from Agamben to, uh, to some extent to, uh, to Alain Badiou, uh, you can find that uh, uh, that um, there is a weak uh, point in uh, this field, and uh, it is sort of uh, uh, question how to con conceive uh, the state. We know that uh, uh, all uh, uh, radical philosophy. Con uh, has concentrated on the critique of uh, the state as a uh, uh, machinery or as a um, kind of uh, the Brancierian uh, police order. But uh, I would say that the uh, contemporary radical movements uh, uh, face uh, the question how to re uh, regain or uh, regain uh, the state as uh, the uh, assembly of institutions. Can, uh, a, uh, can a radical politics uh, uh, connected with the state exist? It is the main question according to me. And uh, I tried to 
use the experience provided by the Prague Spring. Uh, I uh, consider the Prague Spring as a great invention in this direction Be, uh, because uh, uh, during the Prague Spring, uh, a special dialectic between the state, the state structure, and the movement from below uh, was launched. And uh, this dialectic is uh, the main invention of the Prague Spring, which can be seen as uh, the heritage uh, uh, provided uh, by, uh, by uh, the Prague Spring uh, uh, us and we can we can uh, learn from the Prague Spring lesson how to proceed in uh, this uh, sense. Uh, the speci specific uh, uh, or spe specific uh, trait of the Prague Spring uh, is that uh, the uh, re reforms. Uh, began to turn to re revolution. It is a specific kind of revolution uh, which comes from uh, gradual reforms in the field of the state, of the state structure, uh, which led to the overall uh, social uh, move and uh, uh, following uh, revolutionary movements. And uh, uh, as uh, Petr Kujel pointed in uh, his article on uh, workers' uh, councils in, uh, uh, in Czechoslovakia during the Prague Spring, uh, th this invention uh, had, um, uh, had to for the concrete, concrete uh, shape uh, into uh, bodies uh, or, or into social bodies uh, such as uh, uh, the councils and the, uh, in the companies but uh, this was not only a social movement this movement was connected with the uh, law uh, at that time, uh, to this, uh, representative of the Prague Spring preferred uh, so-called uh, the uh, social uh, the law uh, can uh, translate it uh, to the law uh, of uh, the socialist enterprise, and this is a, a remarkable trait of the Prague Spring that the uh, res results of the movement from below uh, is consolidated uh, at the level of uh, uh, the law system. It is really a re remarkable uh, point uh, uh, of the Prague Spring. Uh, and um, one of the uh, edit uh, authors of the book, Jan Kob Kober, uh, show it uh, the development of the law system in the 1960s in Czechoslovakia. This development of the law system reflected uh, the movement in uh, the society and uh, opened new vision of uh, uh, the legal, legal system. And uh, this is uh, uh, what I uh, what I call the uh, emancipatory transfiguration of the state. Uh, the point is uh, to uh, show the dialectic between the state and uh, the spontaneous movement. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like uh, uh, to finish on this point, uh, I don't want to keep you uh, too long. And uh, uh, I 
skip uh, other contributions so because uh, the authors uh, Ivan Landa and uh, Jan Merbart, Katarzyna Bielinska are present here and uh, uh, they can uh, can uh, uh, s uh, say something uh, if they like. So I would pass the word uh, back to Jana and thank you for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Michal. Uh, with uh, Katarina or or uh, I think Jan maybe left. Uh, would you like to add something about uh, your paper and you know your focus and Petra maybe something about the Workers' Council? Would you like to add something to this? Um, just to talk about your personal research focus, maybe. His mic is muted. Yeah, I think Petra is muted. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to show on historical material uh, something about the uh, Rancier logic between police, uh, between order of police and uh, uh, order of uh, politics. And it was already said that um, these two logics are not really heteronomous but they are very specific dialectics between both. And I wanted to show on the, on the example of uh, fight for workers' councils in 1968, that, uh, that uh, this uh, emancipatory politics starts uh, with, uh, with uh, state structures from, it was uh, launched by Communist Party and uh, organs of, uh, of states, but it provokes a spontaneous movement. And these spontaneous movements tried uh, very spontaneously founded uh, workers' councils. It was uh, 900,000 of uh, people who are members of these workers' councils. So it was, wasn't uh, in any sense something uh, marginal. And this uh, councils was uh, enforced the government and the Communist Party to, uh, to, to establish this, uh, these uh, workers' councils uh, by, by law, as uh, Michal already, already said. And uh, after the invasion, the <coughs> students, uh, students' uh, strikes and workers' strikes wasn't not against the party or against the, the state, but uh, it was fight for the party and for the state. And it was the fight that gave uh, to people, the, to parts of no parts, uh, their, uh, their voice. So that's what I wanted to show on historical examples. Okay, thank you very much, Petr. I was wondering, maybe uh, Katarzyna, do you have something to say about how these workers' councils relate to, you know, the uh, the context of uh, Poland and Yugoslavia. It's a long story. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for it. Would be a long story, and we are running out of time. So very briefly and very shortly. And sorry for simplification, but I think we all here know more or less the story about workers' councils in Poland in 1956. And uh, we know uh, the we know the story about Yugoslavia. So the general uh, the general idea uh, was to show uh, in my case was to show uh, was to show uh, not uh, quoting uh, Michael emancipatory transformation of the state, but contrary, seeing real socialism as a system of bureaucratic exploitation of the working class, uh, uh, providing an outlook of uh, Marxist humanism, uh, which of course we know it could be, uh, is criticized uh, as uh, not theoretical in Althusserian sense or, um, or uh, in, other uh, in, the, in other language 
uh, non-philosophical in terms of Marek Siemek, but uh, how it uh, played its role as the uh, ideology of the working class revolting against uh, bureaucratic, bureaucratic ruling. Yeah, so, and just uh, in this, uh, but it cannot be, uh, and uh, so it's, uh, and uh, it, it's connected with, uh, it is expressed in the uh, title uh, of, the, um, of the paper, uh, Marxist uh, humanism as the philosophy of self-management or its correlate. So rather it's ideological correlate, which had its, uh, very important uh, has had its very important role role but not philosophy of course not philosophy in the uh, in other terms than uh, artists uses but it's a, it's another story okay and if there are not any other remarks then i would pass uh, to uh, the word to ivan landa so Ivan Landa is a researcher at the Institute of Philosophy of the Czech Academy of Sciences. And, uh, you know, uh, they have a department with who some of the other contributors to, the, to this book are members of this department studying more specifically, you know, the Czechoslovak uh, Marxism of, uh, you know, the, uh, the second half of the 20th century, which I would say is a really important work because uh, for a long time, this thinking has been very much obliterated. And so I would ask uh, Ivan maybe to present some of the research of the group and, you know, uh, whatever uh, you would yes, like thank to you. say. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for uh, introducing me and for uh, organizing this virtual event with uh, the small letter E. And uh, I won't be talking directly about uh, our department uh, and our research, only indirectly and also indirectly about, uh, about uh, the, the present volume, since uh, originally I was asked about uh, to provide uh, you with very, you know, um, uh, concise roadmap uh, of the Czechoslovak Marxism uh, in uh, connection with uh, the Prague Spring 1968. And uh, of course, this is a huge uh, task to be accomplished in, uh, I don't know uh, if I uh, have 20 minutes or 15. So I will uh, cut brutally the, the, the long story short and uh, provide you only with uh, the map with, uh, the, with a low re resolution. So I hope you will catch at least uh, the, the contours of, uh, of uh, Czechoslovak uh, Marxism. Uh, if you allow me, uh, I will share with you um, a PowerPoint presentation. And uh, I will go off uh, with a small detour or a small uh, observation that uh, relates to Czechoslovak Marxism, as I think. Uh, it is usual uh, to speak of uh, Western Marxism, which is broadly construed as uh, including diver diverse thinkers and currents of thought, such as critical theory, phenomenological Marxism, psychoanalytical Marxism, and even post-Marxism. And uh, there is certainly no doubt uh, in, a, in a attaching uh, a, the attribute theory to the Western Marxism. In contrast, uh, East Central European Marxism and even much more uh, the Soviet Marxism is usually taken to be either ideology, this used to be a perspective of Sovietology, or as eclectic theoretical endeavor. So it is sometimes belief, uh, believed that uh, it has been theoretically interesting only because of uh, absorbing intellectual impulses from the, from the Western Marxism, from phenomenology, existentialism, and, uh, and so on. However, such a orientalist perspective is doubtful and motivates the following question. Is it possible to talk about distinctive uh, phenomenon of Eastern Marxism, which uh, would not be reducible in its creative moments to the borrowings from critical theory and so on? My zero claim or zero hypothesis says that there was exactly such an intellectual phenomenon as uh, Eastern Marxism. 
Famously, uh, British historian Perry Anderson has argued in 1976 in his book, Considerations on Western Marxism, that there are at least three defining feature, uh, features of Western Marxism. One of them being uh, methodologism. Another one consists uh, in almost exclusive emphasis on superstructural phenomena, especially on arts and artistic practice. And finally, it was uh, a constant pessimism with regards to the perspective of revolutionary politics. So with a few exceptions, Western Marxists were, according to uh, Anderson, evolutionists who occupied their ivory towers at the university campuses without any contact with uh, the real politics or uh, with social and economic str struggles of the working class. I assume that Eastern Marxism can be defined, defined analogically uh, through methodological turn, which uh, had in fact two different outcomes as I will show in a minute. For now, it suffices to say that methodological turn resulted into uh, rethinking of the, of the dialectical method and at uh, the attempts to carry out the reconstruction of a historical materialism. Uh, the reconstruction went in two different directions. Uh, some of them stressed the importance of superstructural phenomena, such as culture, law, religion, and especially uh, politics. Besides that, Eastern Marxism, at least during 1960s, can be character characterized by sheer revolutionary optimism that can be described as longing for total revolution, to quote the book title by, by uh, Bernard Yack. Of course, uh, Eastern Marxists understood themselves as engaged intellectuals whose uh, main political goal was to contribute both theoretically and practically to the success of socialist revolution, which would not be limited only to the building up of democratic institutions or to securing uh, basic political freedoms. In their perspective, revolution required, required the self-management of workers the securing of social and economic rights, and all this was coupled with the hope in a radical technological progress bound to uh, automation. The majority of them were party intellectual, intellectuals, hence they also occupied, in some sense, the ivory towers uh, at universities, academic and party institutions, However, many of them were actively engaged in the real politics, especially during the Prague Spring 1968. Uh, uh, as I've mentioned above, Eastern Marxism can be characterized uh, by methodological turn that took place in 1950s, almost simultaneously, yet initially independently at different places in Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, East Germany, Yugoslavia, as well as in Soviet Union. So there had to be something in the air uh, at that time. Still, uh, I don't think the methodological turn can be explained only by the reference to the political events, for, for example, to the death of Stalin or to the critique of the, the cult of uh, personality or Stalinism uh, as such. There were, there were much deeper systematic reasons at play inherent to the Marxist philosophy. First of all, um, it was partly due to the Renaissance of uh, the Leninism and partly due to uh, the coming back uh, to the philosophical debates in Marxism in early 1920s. So accordingly, the methodological turn had at least two important sources, uh, one of them being Lenin uh, and his philosophical notebooks, and the second one, Jörg Lukács, history and the class consciousness. And I think that each of them motivated quite different course of the methodological turn. Lenin famously stressed the importance of Hegel's science of logic for understanding of Marx's capital. At the same time, he claimed that uh, although Marx did not write any logic of his own, there is still something like uh, the logic of his capital. In Lenin's views, uh, view, uh, Marxism should hold on Marx's theorems of value, exploitation, of crisis, and so on. But besides that, it is equally and perhaps even much more important to understand the methodology employed by, by Marx 
in his uh, theorizing uh, of the social reality. Hence, Marxists should pursue the project that would aim at extracting the logic or methodology uh, employed by Marx, laying it bare independently of Marx's conceptual apparatus. In this case, methodological turn consisted in the retreat from the concreteness, from social reality, from the real people, and ongoing social struggles. Instead, the attention has been paid uh, to the dialectics understood as a methodology and farther to the way how to build scientific theories, uh, what are the basic categories employed uh, within the, the scientific discourse, and especially to the problem of explanation of social phenomena uh, and to the formulation of uh, social laws. So uh, I shall call this specific form of Marxist theory uh, meta-Marxism. And just to give you some examples, uh, I quote some book, uh, books titles from Czech uh, and Slovak provenience. So you can see it's uh, on the logic of Marx capital, uh, the contribution made by Marx capital to the knowledge of social laws, or uh, the problems of semantics, the method of science, the dialectical scient uh, scientific law, or methodology and philosophy. Interestingly, during the 1960s, the metamarxism has been transformed into epistemology, general semantics, logic proper, philosophy of science, cybernetics, system theory, and later uh, into soci sociological methodology. Typically, all the explicit references to Marx, Lenin, or Marxism disappeared altogether yeah, during those, those years. At the same time, uh, the methodological turn took uh, a wholly different shape. Uh, it has been inspired by Gert Lukács, who proposed a methodological understanding of Marxism already in 1920s. In brief, he claimed that Marxism is not, not a doctrine, it's not a propositional content, but consists only in dialectical met method. Therefore, it is possible to imagine that all theorems formulated by Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, or Trotsky can be falsified and dismissed. Uh, but still, it will be possible for somebody to proclaim himself or herself to be a Marxist because uh, of the dialectical method. So here, in contrast to metamarxism, the dialectical method is understood differently. It is not only a method of thought or of theory, but it, it is supposed to operate directly with it, within the social reality as far as the self-conscious beings are integral part of social reality. In this case, the methodological turn aimed at concreteness, at social reality and especially on real human beings living, thinking, and acting here and now. In traditional version of historical materialism, the real human beings were uh, rather neglected, and the atten uh, attention was paid to macrostructures, social laws, technological progress, without uh, any serious um, focus on human beings as subjects that produce and reproduce uh, social form that engage in, uh, in social struggles uh, that motivate and intervene into uh, technological progress and so on. So I call this kind of methodologically motivated Marxism uh, philosophy of praxis. And again, I uh, give you just a few uh, book titles uh, uh, that were like important contributor, uh, contributions to the philosophy of praxis in 1950s and 1960s. So it's, for example, the modern spiritual reality and Marxism, dialectics of the concrete, individual and society, civilization at the crossroad, etc. The philosophy of praxis had a wide range, uh, as you can assume, of themes uh, to cover. It focused on labor, revolution, and more specifically on the problem of scientific technological revolution, on automation, as well as on modern technology, on everydayness, and alienation on human nature and farther on culture as a structure of meanings and uh, on the problem of real realism in arts and also on the problem of use value in relation to industrial design. However, the central issue uh, remains to be following 
how social reality and the structures of meaning are produced and reproduced through human activity and how it can be radically, I mean, social reality transformed through revolutionary practice. So in contrast to metamarxism, which refrained from any judge judgments concerning politics, economics, culture, or human beings, philosophy of praxis was politically engaged through and through. As a matter of fact, philosophy of praxis has provided the theoretical underpinnings of the political events bound to the Prague Spring 1968. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, enough, uh, enough time but I should uh, only mention through uh, three uh, most significant uh, philosophies of uh, praxis. And I think each of uh, them gives evidence uh, for the assumption that during 1960s, the central issue in Eastern Marxism has been the problem of human nature and uh, human essence. So the, like issues that fall um, under the umbrella of uh, uh, philosophical anthropology. So uh, Kosik, um, in his dialectics uh, of the concrete, uh, he tried to elaborate uh, philosophy of praxis in the direction of social ontology. And uh, this ontology is grounded uh, conceptually in the, in the uh, theory of uh, or ontology of labor, which uh, he understood as onto creativity. So as an ability to bring about new qualities and even new realities. Kalivoda, uh, in his own contribution, elaborated the version of psychoanalytical materialism in which he attempted to naturalize uh, this ontocreativity and uh, ground it in, in, um, in the conception of human nature. And finally, Radovan Richta uh, proposed a theory uh, that should be uh, somehow, you know, the reconstruction of historical materialism uh, so that it would be able to conceptualize not only industrial societies, but also the, the, the step towards post-industrial societies. And um, he proposed a theory of uh, the forces of production, which is grounded in the theory uh, or the notion of human creativity, which uh, he strives uh, to reconcile with the ideal of, uh, of automation. Uh, and this means also with the uh, with the uh, technological determinism. And uh, I will skip um, uh, some details, and I will just uh, just mention that uh, uh, not only the examples of Kosik, Kalivoda, or Richter, there were definitely uh, many other uh, thinkers. Uh, they show that uh, the discussions on political reforms, social revolution, and on uh, automation uh, that were topical during the Prague Spring uh, in 1968, that were based on philosophical debates that concerned human nature and human essence. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you for, uh, for the attention. Thank you so much, Ivan. Uh, I think this is a really tip of the iceberg, right? <laughs> uh, I would like to ask uh, maybe the contributors of the book if you have any questions for Ivan uh, regarding uh, what you just presented about uh, you know, uh, Czechoslovak uh, thinking and Marxism and so on. I had a question for Ivan. Um, I was I was wondering, Ivan, we've we've talked about Radovan Richter and you didn't say too much about him, but I find fascinating the 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 contradictions that he gets himself into in in a very interesting uh, intellectual project that he has. And and I, I wonder if you could say, I mean, people are maybe more familiar with Kosik and and uh, some of the other figures you talked about, but I think uh, uh, Richter is 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 really interesting in a lot of ways that you've been working on, and uh, and I and I wonder if you could say a little bit more about your your understanding of his contributions and their limitations. 
All right, so uh, I will try to do it uh, in brief. Uh, well, basically, and uh, I think that that was also the, the, the theme of our uh, talk about uh, Radwan Richter, was that uh, not only him, but also, you know, other philosophers of praxis, they relied uh, and tried to somehow, you know, synthesize the young Marx that uh, had a theory of, uh, you know, total humanity uh, of uh, human being that can uh, develop all his capacities and skills and powers and so on uh, under certain circumstances with the idea that uh, Marx voiced, uh, especially in Grundrisse, where uh, he was uh, thinking about uh, the, the labor and this distinction he drew in early um, manuscripts between the necessary and uh, labor and free labor. Yeah. Later on, he has uh, he made a distinction between labor, which just covered necessary labor, which means uh, like instrumental activity, uh, like uh, directed to to central goal, uh, some goal. And uh, on the other side, the free activity, which he did not uh, call uh, labor, but uh, precisely, you know, the, the creative activity. And his idea was that uh, since uh, the progress, technological progress, will uh, bring sooner or later uh, the uh, complete automation of the production, so it means the level of this necessary labor, yeah, the space will be opened for uh, human beings to cultivate themselves, to uh, be engaged in uh, free activities and so on. So uh, his humanism uh, presupposed uh, the, the uh, certain theory of the technological progress and uh, much of the hope uh, in, he put in, into automation. And of course, uh, at the same time, the, the, the debates on automation were not limited only to this Eastern Marxism, but uh, were uh, quite uh, vivid also uh, in, I suppose, also in France, in uh, USA and so on. And uh, I think in, in the late 50s or at the beginning of the 60s, uh, 60s Hannah Arendt uh, uh, wrote a paper called Human Condition. The, the paper had the same title as a, as a book she later, uh, she later uh, wrote, uh, where she challenges this view uh, that the automation will, you know, uh, unbound uh, free activity of human beings. Uh, as she uh, supposed or assumed that uh, automation will make production more efficient. Yeah, in the sense there will be like more products for more people with uh, low you know energy costs and so on but on the other side since the products will be available uh, easily for like uh, many people uh, the the people won't be uh, gaining the free time engaged uh, in uh, in uh, developing their activities and capacities but they will uh, just consume yeah so automation and consume consume uh, society are just you know the twins in her conception so uh, but uh, as I think you know Richter and his colleagues they were more optimistic and uh, they uh, thought it's or assumed it's possible to square the circle, you know, to square humanism, total humanism, with uh, the, like, total technological determinism. Uh, so, uh, in, in this sense, I find uh, the Richter's theory, uh, and, of course, the theory of other, many other thinkers who were part of, or the members of uh, Richter's team, who, uh, you know, developed very interesting um, ideas uh, that would fall today under the umbrella of, you know, uh, transhumanism, as they, uh, you know, focused on the idea that you know, we have this forces of production, means of production, and human uh, labor force, yeah, which was reinterpreted, as I have mentioned, as a productive force, yeah. It was like productivity unbound, and uh, they said precisely this human uh, productive, creative uh, 
force uh, allows for extensive and intensive growth, not only means of production where you have uh, more, sophistic more sophisticated machines and automata. Yeah. And uh, uh, as I've mentioned, Kalivoda, uh, who uh, developed the theory of human nature, yeah, which is like this biological infrastructure that for him uh, cannot be separated from this, you know, human essence, which is for him this social nature of, or, or the second nature of the human beings. So he thought, you know, there is certain continuity between those two natures, this biological and the social, and uh, the, the biological always encroaches into this social realm. So uh, he thought this biological infrastructure is something, you know, stable, constant. He calls it anthropological constant. Yeah. And the, the adherence of uh, scientific technological revolution, for example, Otto Klein, he thought, you know, perhaps also this biological nature sometimes will allow for some, you know, changes and uh, variability. So he thought there is nothing constant in reality within this, you know, you know, human nature. So in this sense, we should not like conceptually distinguish between nature and essence. Yeah. So. Uh, I think that uh, the conception of scientific technological revolution opened up so many themes and topics that uh, I think still are uh, topical at, uh, at our days, especially as the uh, you know uh, ideal of automation touches uh, every uh, our everyday life and uh, yes, and uh, is part of uh, not only of you know the sphere of production but uh, of our life world. Thank you so much, Ivan. And I have maybe a question to sort of make work this uh, chiasmus, uh, you know, which is at France and Czechoslovakia. I was wondering, uh, maybe for Etienne Balibar, uh, to ask you whether you know if there has have and also this point and this relates to uh, one question that someone in the Q and A was asking, if whether Ivan you know what were the sort of international connections of these thinkers uh, that you presented uh, like Karel Kosik, uh, Kalivoda, and Richter, and I would be curious whether Etienne, also you whether like to what extent you know that their work was known or uh, you know present in the French circles uh, if you have any experience with that so it's a question be, for both Etienne and yes, Ivan I, I will be very brief uh, first of all I have to return to the publications of the time but I I think that uh, uh, um, very few of these works were translated at least into French. And personally, I remember reading some of it in German uh, because this was the only possibility uh, uh, I had to access them. But then I have to confess that uh, the kind of structuralist Marxism <laughs> in which I was uh, 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 raised at the time produced uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, blindness, I would say, uh, to the kind of questions that uh, uh, where uh, you have just uh, dealt with, etc. So uh, uh, there's no point in uh, being uh, <laughs> apologetic or etc. This is one <laughs> aspect of the uh, divide. <laughs> we had a tendency, and I'll finish with that, uh, in our circle. Uh, and I, I, I think it would be interesting to hear Reza because I think that Deleuze and Guattari later, of course, uh, were very differently oriented, but uh, I'm not sure if they also uh, paid uh, great attention to, to, to that. We had a tendency to uh, put everything that uh, labeled itself philosophy of praxis in the same uh, basket, I would say. Uh, so, uh, which uh, listening to you uh, clearly is, uh, is a great confusion. Just as we, uh, I would say, the Althusserian circle, uh, uh, because in fact of Althusser's uh, uh, apparent uh, hostility, were uh, uh, very much uh, against 
the idea that the Lukashian legacy was something uh, important. Needless to say, I totally changed my point of view <laughs> today, and I uh, uh, am reading uh, uh, Lukács uh, very uh, eagerly, uh, not only because I believe that the uh, transformation of the idea of consciousness into the idea of praxis is something extremely important, even or if or because it has Hegelian origins, but also because I believe that the category of the identical subject object uh, or that we have, perhaps we can also reverse or transform into a problem of the non-identical subject object is a question of enormous relevance, uh, re relevance in, the, in, in today's politics. Now, because I have to end, I, I, I'd say that, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, my feeling, you know, at the time, for example, what I read from uh, Czechoslovakian uh, philosophers was particularly essays and articles on the question of cybernetics and therefore also uh, uh, technology and I think that they were much more advanced in fact in fact than uh, many philosophers in the West on that question uh, I see uh, I say I praised Habermas a moment ago but when Habermas writes about uh, technique as ideology uh, clearly technology is on one side and humanism is on the other side whereas mm -hmm. the 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 articulation that you that you uh, uh, describe, especially when it comes to suggesting that the so-called essence of man or, or biological invariant of, of man is something that becomes transformed both by technology and society, is something which is extremely different from that uh, Frankfurt School uh, uh, variety of uh, philosophy of, uh, of, 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 of praxis, and therefore, of course, uh, enormously interesting. But this is something that I perceive <laughs> retrospectively and uh, uh, when I look back to those years I uh, see that uh, we lived in two different worlds mm. not everybody if you take something as somebody like Andre Gortz of course uh, he's uh, uh, he's uh, very very he has a very different perception but the Althusserians had a terrible tendency to put everything under the label of humanist Marxism, which prevented mm -hmm. from discussing and uh, and seeing the, the, the differences, you know. And 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 Althusser had uh, had explained that humanism and uh, philosophical anthropology were two names for the same uh, uh, thing. Uh. Mm -hmm. Foucault, in the order of things, began to 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 open up the 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 the, the, the question. And today I'm completely convinced that the question of philosophical anthropology is central one uh, which doesn't make uh, me uh, necessarily uh, nostalgic of certain forms of uh, of humanism but that's a long discussion you know, we could have hmm. Ivan would you like to maybe react to that or is there anyone else from the contributors I think, uh, Etienne, you were making allusion to Vincent's research on Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, Vincent, is there anything uh, you would like to add, do you know, about any links between Deleuze and Guattari and these thinkers? I don't know, but I think they don't read this tradition. So maybe, maybe a Guattari, uh, Guattari reads it, but... Uh, Deleuze references are quite uh, <laughs> of, um, about Western philosophy, no? So I, I, I don't know. Maybe at the time of uh, the uh, Until Zip, there's a lot of uh, strange reference for uh, French philosopher, but I don't think I, I see uh, Czech references. But it's a, it's a good question. Um. And I think Joe uh, Grim Fanberg writes me that he has a comment to make. Uh, yeah, I mean, just just following up on Ivan's presentation, I, I from the other side of the picture, it is very interesting how, in spite of this difference between what the Althusserian tradition and the the Czechoslovak reform Marxists were writing about and thinking about. 
there were a lot of points in which they could have had interesting discussions that generally didn't happen back then. I mean, not only the question of humanism, which it's, it is remarkable that the, the Czech Slovak humanists uh, didn't react directly to these Althusserian criticisms and then post-structuralist criticisms of humanism at the time. Uh, but also it's interesting that there is a Czech structuralist tradition. And so Czech and Slovak humanism comes also back with a kind of revival of interest in structuralism in this specific Prague structuralist uh, linguistic circle tradition. And so then the next moment, there is this kind of post-structuralism that happens in a certain sense in Czechoslovakia, but it's a completely different post-structuralism and different, different discussion about humanism and anti-humanism. And it's kind of a, a shame that that discussion didn't happen actively at the time, but I, it is interesting that we can then make this discussion happen in some sense today. Any other comments, reactions? This may be one question from the public. Uh, Stephen Mayu uh, is asking Ivan Landa. Uh, so he says, Ivan, you mentioned in passing uh, the, I quote, philosophical anthropology. Uh, was the philosophy of praxis you've outlined uh, related by its 1960s proponents to critiques of philosophical anthropology in France in the 1960s? For example, Derrida's uh, article, The Ends of Man, a paper actually given in the US in October 1968. Well, um... I have to admit, I, I don't know much about this uh, this link. Uh, if there has been any any you know uh, influence of that uh, paper written by or uh, this speech, this talk uh, del delivered by Derrida in um, in uh, like these eastern quarters, but uh, definitely you know as I was listening to this. Uh, connections between French uh, and uh, Czechoslovak or Eastern discussions, uh, I would definitely uh, mention, you know, the phenomenological Marxists in, in France. There, I think, has been much closer, you know, um, discussion uh, occurring at that time. Uh, so definitely, you know, uh, Kosik read Tranduk uh, Tao, yeah, uh, this Vietnamese uh, Marxist philosopher. And uh, there were other philosophers, I think, in France, who uh, somehow, you know, received uh, with en enthusiasm uh, the dialectics of, uh, of the concrete as it appeared in, in German uh, translation yeah, in, uh, in the late 1960s. So uh, I'm not sure about, for example, Michel, Michel Henry, if uh, he could have known uh, Kosik and um, and other uh, philosophers coming from from Czechoslovakia, but perhaps I should also mention Kalivoda because his essay on Marx and Freud has been translated uh, into French language in uh, the late 1960s. But uh, again, I I don't know much about uh, any you know reception uh, among uh, French intellectual intellectuals. Yeah, so. Um, Definitely, the situation have changed uh, during uh, 1970s or after 1968, when there was this, you know, uh, wave of uh, emigration and uh, exile, and uh, a lot of Marxist philosophers uh, came to to France, to Paris, and uh, that could be, you know, occasion for uh, some contact and. Uh, of course, at that time, uh, Marxism uh, has been in the crisis, which uh, paradoxically, you know, um, expressed or voiced itself uh, in that many Marxists started to write the history of Marxism yeah, and started to uh, retell the whole 
big story of uh, uh, making up of, of Marxist uh, theory in its variety. And uh, of course, there were many Marxists who uh, were very critical uh, towards uh, towards Marxism, like Leszy Kulakowski, if you read his, his uh, book on the history of the Marxism. But uh, there were many others, uh, Hobsbawm, uh, you know, several volumes uh, of the history of Marxism, where uh, I think a couple of Czech authors uh, made contribution. For example, Lubomir Sochor, uh, Miloš, Hayek, uh, Miloš Hayek, the historian, and, uh, and others. And uh, at that time, at, in the late 1970s, uh, those thinkers, uh, uh, Sochor, for example, came in the late 70s uh, to, to France when uh, uh, Marxism was not, uh, you know, very popular. Uh, so um, he had, in the sense, you know, difficulties to to uh, establish, you know, the Marxism and the history of Marxism as a as a research theme at uh, at his uh, at, the, at the university or at the department where he. Uh, worked, but it's another story. It's a post-1968 story, and uh, yeah, that would be my uh, answer or non-answer to this question about Derrida. I always forget the micro. Maybe to conclude, I'd like to pass the word to Joe, who will present us another monster, which I don't know, Joe, is this the last volume of Contradiction, Contradicte, uh, which is an English uh, um, Marxist journal, uh, half in English, half in Czech. So uh, if you can maybe just present that. Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Jana. I'll be brief because I know we're over time. But, um, but we have had uh, the pleasure of having this opportunity to have Yana be kind of a node of conversation between some of the work that we're doing in Prague, uh, a lot of it surrounding the, the Department for the Study of Modern Czech Philosophy, of which Ivan is the department chair. And yeah, we put out this, this journal, Contradictions, uh, or Contradictions in English, Contradictze in Czech, um, once a year, large volume. And uh, we have a lot of precisely the kind of things we've been discussing today is very much what we are interested in looking back at the history of radical left thought in Central and Eastern Europe, but in conversation with uh, things that are theoretical discussions taking place around the world. Um, and so, yeah, uh, Jana held up the second to last uh, volume, which is on the critique of civil society, which was, of course, a major concept of dissidents and of the interpretation of what dissent meant in the liberal understanding. Um, and we've just published a volume on left feminism. And so that you can find, you can order it or find uh, some online content. Thanks, Jana, for posting the website. You can find also all the back issues. So all these three, you can already find the articles posted on the website. And uh, the left feminism issue is now available as well. And uh, we're also working on a new volume on left dissent that should come out around the end of 2021. So uh, I'm, I hope you all will read and think about contributing to the future and look forward to more collaboration with Suture down the road. And thanks again for organizing the book and the event. And Joe, uh, people can order it through your website, which I posted it, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, there's a link to, to order the books. And uh, yeah. And yes, again, the, the physical copy is nice to have. You can build a house with it or read it. <laughs> okay, any concluding remark for today? Nick, maybe would you like to 
conclude or anything to add? Well, um, I think I think it's uh, as as Etienne said. This this volume is really a wonderful accomplishment. I'm I'm happy to be uh, a small uh, part of it, and uh, and I think that it it really marks. I, I was struck listening to Ivan and and the the richness of this uh, this political and philosophical tradition uh, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe in the 60s, and, and particularly this divide that we've been talking about and that Ivan was uh, 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 gesturing toward. Uh, I think that, and, and, and Joe as well, I think that, that it, it's, uh, the book itself is a really interesting, a really uh, important contribution I think toward uh, bridging that gap, that historical gap that Etienne was talking about that, that has so many uh, uh, complex dimensions and implications and ramifications uh, over the development of these political sequences in, in the West and in the East and in, in their complex uh, silences and gaps and interferences. Uh, misunderstandings, influences, all of this. I mean, there's so many different paths that remain to be followed and developed. And, and I think that it's one of the, the really striking um, um, accomplishments of the volume and, and the contributors, uh, everyone here and, and others who couldn't be with us today, uh, who've, who've, who've marked out such important and, and complex uh, and complexly argued and rendered um, uh, uh, presentations of many of the of the of the elements of this east-west gap and um, uh, divergent uh, conversation and 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 influences and 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 so I think the book uh, marks a real step in overcoming. That that gap and that uh, that uh, historical disjuncture, and uh, and and so I, I hope that uh, the discussion today uh, will lead others to take a look at at uh, some of these really interesting um, chapters that people have contributed, and that it that it will mark uh, an important step in some small way in terms of. Of, of enriching and complexifying that, that ongoing political and theoretical discussion that, uh, that we've figured between Paris and Prague, between 68, 89, and the present, and the, 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 the present uh, uh, imperatives and problems confronting us in, uh, in late capitalism in, in 2021. Okay, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, thanks to all the, everyone for attending. Thanks to our contributors for making this book possible and you know for being involved in those debates. Again, if you want to stay in touch, just uh, have a look at our website uh, or write us an email, you can uh, check the Facebook, you can check the order the book at our improvised e-shop where my co colleague Monica is handling all the orders. And so just feel free to stay in touch with us uh, through other, uh, other means. And thanks to everyone for this little webinar. And I hope it will be soon in person and it will be more fun to <laughs> have our conferences. <laughs> In, in, in person, whether in Prague or in New York or in Paris or whatever that can be in Africa, maybe. Yeah, and thank you, Jana, for all the, all the, all the work thank that you, you've Jana. done to make this happen. Thank you, Jana. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank right. you, Jana. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for coming. Thanks, Jana. Thanks, everyone. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. Okay.